Hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of History Media. This one is all about the AK-47, the terrorist's choice. There ever been a more famous or rather infamous combination of letters and numbers the AK-47 or Aftermath Kalashnikova to give it its official title has become one of the most widely used pieces of weaponry on the planet, with between 75 and 100 million having been produced since 1949. That's roughly one for every 75 to 100 people on Earth. Sadly this is a gun that has a nasty habit of finding its way into the most atrocious of conflicts over the last 70 years. Its rugged dependability has made it a favorite for many an insurgency terrorist organizations, drug cartels, and is today still used by countless governments around the world. This is the story of a gun that has changed the way we fight. And one that has bought power, prestige and untold misery to millions. In terms of technological achievement, the AK-47 is in a world of its own. Never in history has a piece of weaponry been so mass-produced, and so adored by so many. There's nothing flashy about it. It's just a solid and reliable gun that can often be bought for absurdly low prices with no questions asked. Envy can push people to extraordinary levels, and so was the case with the birth of the AK-47, or so the story goes. We've added that slight disclaimer there because as with many of the heroic tales, which tended to appear out of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. This one too, has a slightly hazy but still glorious backstory. The USSR was the undisputed king of twisting myth in reality, until it was impossible to distinguish the two and the legend that is the AK-47 is just that. Anyway the story of the AK-47 starts during World War II. As the Nazis began rampaging across the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa in 1941. A few things were becoming clear to the desperate Soviet forces trying to halt the bulldozing blitzkrieg. Not only was the leadership structure an absolute shambles, at this point thanks in no small part to Stalin's purges during the 1930s. But the soldiers defending the motherland were hopelessly ill-equipped compared to their German counterparts. There are epic stories of Soviet forces charging German lines, sometimes with only a single gun for every two or three men a situation that would have been inconceivable by the Germans. Quite remarkably the Soviets held on and eventually began inflicting Hitler's first large-scale defeats. As they drove the Nazis back from Moscow and St. Petersburg, the motherland had been saved. But their success had been down to numbers the terrible Russian winter and some awful military decisions by Adolf Hitler. That technology compared to the Germans with the exception of some of their tanks, was still incredibly poor. The Soviets had been hugely impressed with the German Sturmschwer 44. The first successful assault rifle, which had been used with great success on the Eastern Front. In response, the Soviets quickly produced their version the SKS, which was designed in 1944 but didn't enter service until the following year when the war was almost at a close. This was an upgrade on what the Soviet forces had been using beforehand, but it came with several limitations. Namely its 10-round limit, and the fact that it wasn't fully automatic. For the briefest periods it was the standard-issue gun for Soviet forces, until it could be usurped by a gun, that would eventually spread to all corners of the globe. As far as contradictions go the fact, that the man who designed the most popular gun the world has ever seen, was also a poet, who wrote six books is certainly right up there. Mikhail Kalashnikov was born in 1919 the 17th of 19 children. During Stalin's deconstructive reorganization plans of the 1930s, he and his family were deported from their home in Kuria, in southern Russia to Tomsk Oblast which is further north. Once he was a teenager, he made his way back home, and eventually began working in a weapons design bureau. In 1938 he was conscripted into the Red Army. First as a tank mechanic, but he rose quickly, and by 1941 he'd attained the rank of tank commander. 
in October 1941 as the Battle of Bryansk raged around him. His tank was hit, then the young Kalashnikov was evacuated to hospital, where he spent the next six months recuperating. It was here according to the glorious annals of Soviet Russia. Kalashnikov overheard his wounded comrades complaining about the dire weaponry they were using compared to the well-equipped German forces. Then and there he decided that he was going to design a gun that would match his nation's enemies. Things did not exactly happen all at once. Once discharged from the army he set about designing a submachine gun, which was passed over by his superiors in favor of the SKS. His second attempt which borrowed from the American M1 Garand rifle was also rejected, but it formed the basis of his entry into an assault rifle design competition in 1946. Yes, that was totally a thing, his winning entry was known as the Mictim, and it was this design that revolutionized everything. The weapon that Kalashnikov submitted in 1946 was known as the AK-1. With another variant referred the AK-2. This was a gas-operated rifle that came with a curved 30-round magazine located above the barrel was a short-stroke gas piston. And the gun came with a breech-block mechanism which closed the gun's breech the end of the barrel moments after it was fired. It also came with a rotary bolt, a small bolt, that essentially locks the bullet in place just before firing and a two-part receiver. The receiver is firearm torque for possible weapon that housed the internal action component such as the hammer bolt and firing pin. These two receivers would later be combined into one. A change which many attribute the weapon's famous reliability to. It also came with dual controls meaning that there were separate switches for the safety and the fire selector. By 1946 Kalashnikov had a weapon that was streaks ahead of other submissions. But the design it still wasn't quite right. In 1947 a new model emerged. Sleeker and more reliable. Much of this new design was recommended by Kalashnikov's assistant Alexander Zayatsev who persuaded him to incorporate the two receives into one, and do the same with a safety and fire selector, which was now included on the same switch. This significantly simplified the design, while also making it much easier to produce quickly. The gun was trialed extensively with the army, who immediately took a shine to it. And in 1949 it was officially incorporated into the Red Army, where it became an immediate favorite. This is a weapon, that has gone on to be adapted and tinkered with for decades now. But let's begin with the original version that appeared in the late 1940s. The first AK-47s weighed just 3.47 kilograms, which is lighter than your average domestic cat, and it came with only eight moving parts inside, which made cleaning and maintaining it quick and easy. Its fixed wooden stock measured 880 millimeters in length, with a barrel length of 415 mm. It fired 7.62 by 39 mm shells at a rate of 600 per minute. Now I know what you're thinking, with only 30 rounds per magazine you're going to get through that incredibly quickly. And yes you're absolutely right, using the gun in fully automatic mode, the shooter would find themselves out of ammo, in the blink of an eye, which is why it was generally used in semi-automatic mode. One of the brilliant last-minute design changes was to place the semi-automatic selector at the bottom with automatic, and then safety above it rather than in order of rate of fire. This meant that in a flash its users could go from safety to the bullet-conserving semi-automatic mode. This brings us to a few other design factors that would make it hugely popular around the world. The gun's recoil was fairly mellow as far as guns go which meant, that it didn't need to be used by a large battle-hardened soldier capable of controlling its huge recoil. Its intermediate-range shells meant that it couldn't hit distances far away. Its effective range was 350 meters, but their lightweight nature meant that soldiers could carry more of them into battle. In any case it was soon found that for use in urban fighting situations it was much better to have something like the AK-47, rather than a more powerful rifle with a further range that required heavier shells and came with a kind of recoil that leaves a bruise. 
In short, the AK-47 it was perfect for smaller soldiers fighting in close combat situations, and has even been referred to as being soldier-proof to demonstrate its ease of use. And this brings us to one of the most disturbing aspects of this weapon, it's so light and so easy to use, it could even be fired by a child. And sadly, in some parts of the world, it's exactly what's happened. Over the years countless images have emerged from across the globe showing child soldiers often gripping an AK-47 with their small stature. It's one of the few weapons that they can handle easily and with an estimated 200 to 300,000 child soldiers operating around the world, it puts the weapon of the 20th century in a very dark light. While we tend to use the blanket name AK-47, that's often not at all accurate. It's probably best to refer to them under the umbrella Kalashniko family, as there have been countless variations along the way. Going through them all would no doubt be informative, but hardly riveting viewing so for the sake of brevity, we're just going to go with the highlights. The first major change came with the AKM, which appeared in 1959. This was an even more simplified model, which made mass production even easier. The overall weight was reduced by 1 kilogram, while the accuracy when firing in automatic mode was improved along with other minor reliability issues. It's thought that just over 10 million were produced in the Soviet Union until 1977. The AK-74 was introduced in 1974, and again improved accuracy while also improving its effective range. That being said, 50% of the gun is exactly the same as the AKM, which shows that most changes were just smaller tweaks. The gun was first used by Soviet forces during the 1979 invasion of Afghanistan where the CIA reportedly offered $50,000 for the first retrieved AK-74, which they were no doubt interested in studying. If you think things may have tailed off after the fall of the Soviet Union, well think again Russia has continued the evolution of the AK. All the way up to the present day with the AK-12. This very much feels like a next-generation AK. With a firing range of 800 meters, and significant ergonomic improvements, including a lightweight shoulder stock, and better grip. It can also fire a broader range of shells that makes it more adaptable, but much of the essence of the gun has stayed the same since 1947. The spread of Kalashnikos around the world has made them an extraordinary success. But also the bringer of death to millions is a gun after all. Now, if we want to think about the biggest military killers, it's easy to think about the atomic bombs that hit Japan. But those numbers pale in comparison to those who have died staring down the barrel of a Kalashniko. Exact numbers are of course impossible to gauge, but look at almost every significant or even small-scale conflict after World War II. Some variation of the Kalashniko has been present from the Vietnam War to the Troubles in Northern Ireland, from Somalia to Yugoslavia, from the Congo to the Syrian civil war still ongoing. The Kalashnikos have played a key role. Every year it's believed at least a hundred thousand die of injuries inflicted by Kalashnikos, or rather by the person holding the Kalashniko. But that number could also be considerably higher. It's not surprising, that these weapons developed an almost symbolic revolutionary aura to them especially during the Cold War. Whether rebels were fighting the capitalist, U.S.A., or communist Soviet Union, they invariably did so with Kalashnikos. To give you an idea of just how important this weapon has been to some Mozambique, East Timor, Zimbabwe, and Burkina Faso have all incorporated an image of it into their national flag. Further around 50 standing armies around the world currently use Kalashnikos for their soldiers. Nowadays it's often not completely clear where the guns have even come from. Because not only is it the most sold weapon on the planet, it's also the most copied. Its simplicity has made the design easy to replicate, and countries around the world are now producing their own versions. Twenty countries currently, and officially make Kalashnikos with China being the largest manufacturer, though it's not exactly clear how many. This is a topic that regularly riles but Sparrow thought the good old Mikhail Kalashniko had he been born in the United States, he would likely have made a fortune from the patent of his design. However being born in the Soviet Union meant, 
that he never received any extra money for his design. And he continued to be paid the standard Soviet wage, even after the gun became a global phenomenon. Six months before his death, Mikhail Kalashnikov wrote a letter to the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church Patriarch Kirill, and detailed how he was in spiritual pain asking, if my rifle claimed people's lives, then can it be that I, a Christian and an Orthodox believer, was to blame for their deaths? Kirill quickly reminded him, that the development of the clash of the cloth rifle was for the defense of motherland Russia, and that the Orthodox Church supported both, Mikhail and his inventions. The AK-47, and its derivatives are still causing massacres around the world. In a bitter twist of fate, the terrorists who stormed the concert hall in Moscow on the evening of March 22, 2024, killing 137 people, were armed with Kalashnikovs. This weapon, which in some cases can be purchased for as little as $10, usually has a slightly higher normal selling price, perhaps between $100 and $300 but it is still ridiculously cheap for a highly successful killing machine. Gun sellers often hide behind the statement that a person must make a conscious decision to pull the trigger, guns don't kill people. People kill people. But when some of the world's poorest and most desperate people are easily supplied with Kalashnikovs and perish in wars that external powers often tend to foment for their own benefit, this is a morality that is completely difficult to accept. People are certainly responsible for killing other people. But does it have to be so absurdly easy? When Mikhail Kalashnikov died in 2013, the list of awards and achievements that he is remembered by is extensive and includes such things as the Order of St. Andrew, Hero of the Russian Federation, All Russian Literary Prize of Suvorov, Order of the Red Star, and countless other awards, and military medals. In addition to statues and monuments depicting Mikhail Kalashnikov, he is also the inspiration for the naming of a state technical university. However none of these awards should distract from Mikhail Kalashnikov's legacy as a provider a family man and a patriot to his country. So, I hope you found that video interesting. If you did please do hit that thumbs up button below, don't forget to subscribe. Also if you've got suggestions for history media in the future, please do let me know about them in the comments below. I often look there to decide what we're making next. Thank you for watching.